Hello, I'm Phil Langton, and I've been a teacher at Hampton for over 20 years. Welcome to Discover Hampton, a podcast that takes you through the school gates and into the classrooms, meeting teachers and pupils, and getting an insight into what today's young people are loving to learn and why. In this, our first series, we're unlocking the wonder of languages, math, science and English, history and music. Today on Discover Hampton, our pupils discuss the power of poetry. Hello, my name is Mike Baker, and I've been teaching English at Hampton for 10 years now. My passion for English and literature stems from the fact that, at its core, it's wholly concerned with human nature and society. In most cases, exploring how we think, feel, and behave towards others in every imaginable context and circumstance. What I enjoy most, alongside helping pupils to develop the necessary analytical skills required to achieve their potential, is encouraging them to embrace the fact that what a text is about at a deeper level can be highly ambiguous. In many respects, this reflects real life, in which we're rarely faced with binary, right-wrong decisions. Among the best moments of being a teacher is when I feel that I have helped equip pupils with the ability to engage with and understand the text from a completely different perspective, whether that's based on its socio-historical context, psychoanalysis, class, or simply being able to consider it as though standing in a completely different individual's shoes, with all of the inference, emotional intelligence, and nuance that this entails. Today, we are going to be exploring a poem by Ghanaian author Kofi Awonur. First of all, we join our third years. Okay, morning gents, welcome. The poem that I've chosen for us today is The Sea Eats the Land at Home by Kofi Awunor. At home, the sea is in the town, running in and out of the cooking places, collecting the firewood from the hearths and sending it back at night. The sea eats the land at home. It came one day at the dead of night, destroying the cement walls and carried away the fowls, the cooking pots and the ladles. The sea eats the land at home. It is a sad thing to hear the wails and the mourning shouts of the women calling on all the gods they worship to protect them from the angry sea. Their ancestors have neglected them. Their gods have deserted them. It was a cold Sunday morning. The storm was raging, and the angry water of the cruel sea was lap-lapping the bark water at the shore. Above the sobs and the deep and low moans was the eternal hum of the living sea. It has taken away their belongings. The sea that eats the land at home eats the whole land at home. So it's quite tricky just on one reading. What I want you to do is to turn over those sheets so you have your uh, copies of the poem in front of you and just to decide with the person sitting next to you in your small groups and just have a discussion about what you think that the poem means on a deeper level once you've grasped what it means on that literal surface level, what's going on. So over to you, chaps, let's have a couple of minutes. So essentially it's a flood, right? Island flood. Or, or a tsunami. The, um, like tsunami. Or a tidal wave, yeah. Could be tsunami. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's flood. more like... Hi, I'm Lorenzo, and um, what I've really liked about studying poetry is how even small phrases, small words, and small changes in poetry can completely alter the connotations of a poem that can help it carry like all sorts of messages that make it a really like expressive literary format. Uh, but if it's yeah. the tsunamis are more kind of sudden because it says somewhere Sunday morning, right? Hi, I'm Zach. My favorite part of learning English has been the creative aspect of it. I really enjoy using my imagination to create stuff that I, and it's really re rewarding. You know that, like, for example, the Fukushima. Yeah, so the tsunami that yeah. the Fukushima power yeah. plant. Um, okay, chaps, that's a fantastic discussion. Let me just pause you there. Let's start with what should hopefully be the more kind of basic glance. We need that to establish our foundation before we think about the deeper level. Can someone have a go at just telling me in brief what they think is literally happening? Go on, Zach. So there's obviously been a flood and it's caused a lot of anguish within a town so it's it's hurt these people they've lost everything they've got and yeah fantastic what a brilliant summary okay 
I entirely agree with you in our literal level. So can we have some suggestions? Don't worry too much about the language at the moment. I want you to put a pin in that to a degree. But just to tell me what you think this therefore is about at a deeper level. Some shots, please. Go for it, Ryan. Well, I think that it's all about global warming. And as Samudi said, there's the um, constant referral to like cooking and heating and that sort of like reflects global warming. And then on the third stanza, it says their ancestors have neglected them and their gods have deserted them, which sort of could see like the impacts that the people before them have caused that they're now suffering from. Phenomenal. I think if you're already jumping even ahead, I mean, I love that you're looking for the language. It's exactly what you need to do to justify your point. But let's go with the first argument that you think this poem is about climate change. So the author is using this poem to draw our attention as readers to the devastating consequences of climate change. And I think that's a fantastic interpretation. So as I said before, what I'm going to do is hopefully going to throw in a bit of a kind of context hand grenade there to see if I can get you to think about it from a different perspective. So let me tell you about the author. So he was born in Ghana in 1935. In 1935, Ghana was still under British colonial rule. He also spent time serving in prison without trial after he was involved in uh, challenging uh, a tyrannical kind of dictatorship. And he wrote about his experience in a book called The House by the Sea. How might that contextual knowledge potentially shape or change your interpretation of the deeper meaning? So I think the sea might not even be literal, it might be metaphorical, um, because we've heard that Ghana is under colonial rule. The sea might just be essentially the colonialist uh, destroying the cement walls, carrying the fowls, cooking pots and ladles. This is like them taking what these people might have, might have had, like using them. We don't, we don't know if they were exporting them or something, but... I think it's becoming more and more evident that there might not actually be a sea. Fantastic. Say. Brilliant. Can we add to that, Philip? Yeah, I mean, this is the sea. I, I think the sea is a term, like, uh, metaphorically, the like the British colonialists coming in from the sea in boats, as they would, um, in ships. And, the, you know, the uh, you have examples like cruel sea um, and lots of, like, examples where this can be, like, seen. Um, and the morning shouts of the women calling on all the gods they worship to protect them from the angry sea. Excellent. OK, I'm going to ask one more question. Of course, we've shown how dramatically suddenly context might shape your understanding. Immediately, suddenly you're opened up to a different interpretation and reading, which might not necessarily, of course, be the correct one, if that's even a thing at all in terms of our interpretation. But let me ask you then, why do we have kind of these references to calling on uh, the gods? How do you think that reflects the feelings of the people involved in this chaos and destruction? Being godless, you're essentially powerless against what's to come. So if you've been deserted by your gods, you you're powerless against the, the sea effect of the your colonialism. Fantastic. So what do you think? I mean, how would you feel then? Because I entirely agree. I think that's a brilliant interpretation, Zach. So how would you feel, though? It's sort of like the helplessness of like, of not being able to do anything. So it's sort of, if you can't do anything physically, you want to you feel like you can call on your gods or something because you because you're you're desperate but you also you're but you're powerless so you're 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 just trying to get something to happen but but you but you can't you're unable to phenomenal okay phenomenal answer bleak situation obviously so what we've got are multiple interpretations so what i'm going to ask you to do is to think in your pairs and your groups about which you think now, more based on the language, some of you might even push yourselves and think about the structure or some of the sound as well, and think about which of these interpretations you personally find the most convincing and why. So, one of the things you've already spoken about, obviously, is that it's about climate change and therefore the power of nature and the natural world, so it's incredible or inspiring power. We've also got the interpretation that it's an allegory for the destructive, kind of indiscriminate violence of colonialism. And then we also have more of a religious reading in this poem. It is about human powerlessness and insignificance. Okay? So, over to you. I want you to now focus even more. You were driving there anyway about the language. Focus even more and see if you can't come up with what you think is the most convincing one. I kind of think I'm leaning towards the colonialism. Yes, the, it is the strongest one. I was going to say something about the form because um, the form, it's so here there's fives, here there's here there's nine, here there's eight, I think, and here there's three. We'll leave our third years now and move on to our lower six pupils who are going to look at the same poem by Kofi Awanur 
but with that extra layer of challenge that comes with evaluation and having to convince your peers of a specific reading and interpretation of the text. Starting, actually, I'm going to start with you, chaps. So tell me, I want you to convince them that this is a poem which is about the power of the natural world or the power of nature and human insignificance. Right, so you can see in the third stanza at the very end, above the sobs and the deep and low moans was the eternal hum of the living sea. It's kind of a sense that what nature is doing is completely overshadowing all the human like suffering that it is causing. And eternal like contributes to the idea of like the timelessness of nature, which also like contrasts with the transience of human life. Fantastic. Is there anything in terms of the structure that would also draw attention to the human powerlessness in response to this? Mike? The stanza length is much shorter for when it's describing, I guess, human humanity and stuff like that, whereas compared to when it's describing how the sea is destroying everything, it's the sea, the sea one's a lot longer, which could also contribute to how it's, well, relatively more eternal to like the transience human life and also it could just be a measure of power in terms of stanza length. Brilliant in that way that where the structure and the form enacts the semantics where yes. effectively it physically enacts its superior strength. Okay why for instance to use a rather leading question then why for instance might it be helpful to you to think about the fact that the opening image including the title and the final one is the same as well? Eternal it's just it's like a cyclical structure in a yes. way it's kind of. What might that suggest the cyclical structure? in terms of their situation. So that no matter what they do to try and stall it, it will eventually happen because they can't stall out nature if it's a ton. So mankind's relative insignificance compared to their size, scale and power and force of nature. OK, I entirely agree. OK, I mean, there's so many more things we could say, but I want to give a chance to kind of Adam and Isaac to take it on here. OK, how could you convince them that it's actually more about spiritual and moral nihilism than it is about kind of uh, the natural world? So, for example, obviously the first thing they said was about the kind of eternal hum of the living sea. And I think instead of looking at it as kind of the powerful elemental kind of nature, I think it's more convincing to look at it as sort of the insignificance and futility of kind of human action. Because there's frequent references to cooking pots, ladles, fire from the hearth, kind of domestic, homely things that are usually associated with kind of warmth and comfort that are completely overwhelmed by the sea. I mean, I think that's a fantastic yeah. start. I mean, I'm going to carry on in a moment, but I think it really does, I, I entirely agree with you, draw attention to just how trivial some elements of our existence are by contrast and comparison. What's interesting there is that you're using very much the same evidence, but trying to use it to underpin a different interpretation. Harry, on, keep going. Uh, in the structure, there's, it's very kind of cyclical, obviously, but also in the sense of throughout the poem, there's references to kind of the seeds land at home directly and also kind of variations of that phrase, which just really emphasizes through the repetition the fact that you know there is nothing they can do um to stop it there's a lot of religious imagery as well yeah i mean yeah. clearly the most obvious is calling on all the go gods they worship to protect them from the angry sea and then two lines later their gods have deserted them it just highlights that you know even if there is a god what are they doing to protect these people there's no sense of you'd expect some sort of spiritual intervention at this point if it was to take a more, you know, promotion of religious pathway. Whereas actually it just continues with this bleak atmosphere. It was a cold Sunday morning, the storm was raging, and there's still this semantic field of, you know, violence and destruction, which just furthers this idea that religion in its essence is futile. It does seem incredibly bleak in that sense. And in fact, in terms of the sensory language and imagery, you both talked about it, in fact. When you talked about kind of home and the hearth and so on, what sensory language or impression are we given? Like warm. Right. Something which is warm. And obviously at home, home is a place of comfort. Exactly. So obviously both comfort and warmth and so on. Whereas here, obviously the dominant image by the time we have the sea coming in, extinguishing that is of what? Coldness. Exactly. Coldness. And of course, do we mean just physical coldness? No, no. kind of emotional emptiness, coldness. And, and spiritual? Yes, I would totally agree, Harry. Okay. We have that spiritual cold comfortlessness that comes with this poem, which of course makes it a tad bleak to analyse, okay? but hugely interesting in this sense. But perhaps unsurprisingly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lob one of those kind of uh, contextual issues in here and see if you still agree uh, with your interpretation. So how does it change or does it change it for you if I was to tell you that the author, he was born in 1935 in Ghana. At that point, it was still under 
British colonial rule. His grandmother, this might be pushing you as well, his grandmother was particularly famous in Ghana for her poems in the oral tradition, specifically dirges, um, which are sort of songs for the dead. That third one's a little bit more kind of ambitious uh, and tricky, but particularly the other two pieces of information, how might they change, or might they at all change your interpretation? Well, it's kind of like the sea is like the British coming in, basically, if that makes sense. Kind of devoid of warmth, like entity just kind of invading into the this kind of town. Fantastic, you've already started to talk about how the British, if we're using it as an extended metaphor and allegory there, are kind of devoid of empathy and compassion. How else are they framed? The sea coming in, okay, and taking ladles and half. Stealing. Thieves, okay, the injustice of it that underpins uh, this poem in that sense. And of course, suddenly now, how does that change the cyclical structure? How might that contribute to our reading? It works quite well with the religious kind of connotations as well, because we were saying earlier about how like, the religion of the cold Sunday morning, there's a sense of like spirituality being quite empty. And also the fact it's Sunday, which is obviously the Christian like day of rest, could link into the fact that a lot of kind of, obviously I don't know if this happened in Ghana specifically, but when the British colonialized African nations, they often kind of forced their own faiths and beliefs onto the local people. So the cold kind of Christian imagery could be seen to like, emphasize how the religion that's been imposed on them is one that basically serves to help them stay oppressed. Fantastic. Sense. How destructive it is, of course, spiritually and physically. That's fantastic. So was your interpretation about the power of uh, the natural world and human insignificance wrong? No. Why not? The points are still valid. Like, yeah. And it's you can not also like they became invalidated. In any way. Sorry. Oh, right. Well, so, OK, so suddenly we're going to fall into the trap here of saying that the literature can mean anything we want. Is that right? Mm, no. no. But there's enough evidence to back up both. No, I think with context, you've got to assume that's not what he was writing about, to be fair. Mm. I think it's even with context, context, it still can serve as an allegory for nihilism or power of nature. Because there's enough like evidence. If you read it with that interpretation in mind, then you can completely see it. It's not like it's really preposterous that you can't even. Fantastic. And so I think I really like that. The whole word is you, you said your phrasing was brilliant, but you can really see it. Like it's not preposterous. And therefore, when you're justifying interpretation. Hi, I'm Isaac. I enjoy the subject because I think the actual analysis of literature and how you can manipulate it to fit different readings or different formats is hugely interesting. Hi, I'm Adam. I do English at A level because I really enjoy the subject. I like the kind of idea of seeing what authors kind of intend to convey beyond the kind of surface level readings. And it's really useful to have a essay-based subject and analysis skills in kind of jobs in the future. Gents, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for your engagement with the poem. Some brilliant ideas there. Thank you very much, sir. Well, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed your fly on the wall visit to the English department today, and that it has given you something of an insight into our lively and engaging lessons. It's impossible to do justice in only a few words to the value of studying English literature, whatever career path you choose to follow. A coding game developer will need to be able to storyboard a compelling narrative as well as create convincing characters and dialogue. A doctor will need an incredible capacity for empathy and emotional intelligence in engaging with their patients to help them establish reliable facts and symptoms. I could go on and on. Perhaps, more importantly, on a purely human level, alongside the joy of reading a superb book, I cannot think of a more enjoyable way of better understanding yourself and the world in which we live. And finally, I leave you with this. Did you know that my current listening time on Audible stands at 6 months, 13 days, 19 hours and 45 minutes? Time superbly spent. And I recommend listening to books on Audible to you all. I promise I'm not taking any commission here. One fact I particularly enjoyed learning is that in 1961, the French writer Raymond Queneau published a work that contained 100 trillion poems, something he achieved by printing 10 sonnets whose lines were all capable of being combined with any from the other nine. A pretty remarkable feat. Maybe the mathematicians can start thinking about how to explain the numbers behind that one to me. Thank you, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing all about English at Hampton. Thank you, Mike. As any teacher will tell you, we live for those golden light bulb moments when everything clicks into place 
And over this series, we'll be witnessing the skill, dedication and passion that great teachers bring to their lessons in Discover Hampton, a podcast from Hampton School. You can find out more at www.hamptonschool.org.uk. Remember to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Goodbye for now.